Um, and so, um, and I think that's great. Um, so, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Hunter O'Haney, and the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And we're very happy to have all of you here. And please say hello to my friend, our guest this evening, Jose Figueroa. Fi Fi ah, Figueroa. Fi Figueroa, yes. And uh, he's very masked, but Jose, say hello. Hi, how are you guys? Nice to Hi. see you. Where are we finding you this evening? I am currently in Richmond, California. I'm reporting from my art classroom. And my students are in front of me at this point. So we're <laughs> all wearing masks. They're very well behaved at this point. Are they really? And they're watching you, they're watching you perform right now, which is really good. How old are how old are your students? What grades are they in? Uh, they're 11 graders. Uh, so I would say 15, 16, yeah. 17, anybody? No, 15, 16. Yeah. How much trouble are they? They are actually, I, I love them. <laughs> we, we met uh, during Zoom years last year that we had distance learning. So it was quite an adventure to perform from that setup. But, you know, they, they are here, they're learning. I'm just having a lot of fun. Great. Uh, being their we're going to get back to you in a minute, and also maybe you'll introduce us to a few of your students as well, too. But let me just tell everybody a little bit about Stonewall. Uh, Stonewall is located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we're one of the largest LGBTQ libraries in the world. Uh, we've been around for 47 years, and the library has 28,000 volumes in it. So um, it is believed to be uh, the largest LGBTQ library everywhere, all organized under the Library of Congress system. And if you go to stonewall-museum.org, you can actually uh, see the card catalog and see all the books that are there. And um, if you're here in South Florida, of course, you can take books out. If you're doing research about uh, queer, t queer books and queer t topics, it's a great way for you to do it as well. In addition, we have an archive, um, and the archive has uh, over 6 million pages, and it's 2,700 linear feet. Now, when I first started there, I didn't fully understand how big that was, but if you think about going all the way up one side of the Empire State Building and then all the way down the other, that's 2,700 linear feet. And so clearly it is a lot of information about queer history uh, dating back to 1950 to the present day serials, personal papers, um, all sorts of documents. And of course, it's a trove for people who want to do research, um, who want to understand about um, who came before them and to know that our history is being re recorded. I'd like to do a shout out to my colleague, Paula Sierra. Paula, are you back there and say hi? Hi, Paula. Nice to see you. Uh, Paula will be here to be able to help us uh, with the talk tonight. This talk is going to be exactly uh, 60 minutes long. It will be archived and uh, put on our website at stonewall-museum.org. If you're joining us on Facebook, hello, welcome, uh, and we're happy to have you here as well, too. Uh, and uh, a lot of people do see these talks there. Um, and uh, also we have two exhibitions up right now. Uh, one is called Don't Ask, Do Tell, uh, which is about the 225 year tortured relationship between the US military and the LGBTQ community. Um, and that will be up for the rest of the summer and probably until sometime in October that will come down. Uh, very fascinating look about the relationship and particularly now that you know Afghanistan is so much on people's minds. And by the way, if you are not aware, there is a real effort going on uh, to help the LGBTQ community in Afghanistan. Um, and if you go to our webpage, uh, you'll be able to see some information about how you, you can help for, for that. Um, and in addition to Don't Ask, uh, Do Tell, we have a show called Off Our Backs, which is looking at early lesbian publications from 1956 to 2000. And what I always say and I find sort of interesting about that show is that as men would tend to fetishize or objectify themselves and each other, uh, women back in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s were using their time and their resources 
in a far more intellectual and community-based way. They were looking at uh, sexual um, autonomy and they were looking about politics and building a community. And so that exhibition uh, is up right now here in Florida. And that will be coming down relatively soon. It will be replaced by a show called Misinformation, which is looking at all of the misinformation that went out during the early years of the um, AIDS crisis. And it's interesting, all of the connections that we see with that um, into the current COVID crisis. So again, if you're here in South Florida, please stop by. Um, if you are not uh, getting our newsletter, you can go to stonewall-museum.org and you can get our weekly newsletter and, and that's good. And finally, I wanna do a shout out to our friends at our fund. Uh, our fund helps make this uh, series possible. Uh, Jose just took his mask off and because he had some people leave the room, we'll see him in a second. Um, but uh, many thanks to our friends at our fund for making all this possible. They're able to provide stipends for all the artists who participate on, on uh, the program. And so I think that's all the info I have for the Right for right now. So let's switch back to Jose. Jose, have a big sip of water and you've uh, you have uh, uh, taken your mask off. Does that mean your students have left the room? Yeah, very diligently and quietly. So I'm eagerly surprised. It's, it's always nice to be able to model the good behaviors, you know, and, and see them look at me doing this type of stuff. So it's, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm glad that the time difference and works out in my favor in that way. Yes, good. So we're finding you in California. Uh, you're in your classroom and you're teaching uh, 11th graders. Uh, what's that like these days? Well, uh, fundamentals of art, which is uh, <laughs> my passion, I guess, and what I do, it's it's great. It's it's different connections you make with younger folks and and I mean, and as an immigrant to this country, it's also very, like, I'm grateful to be in a position where I can teach youth and, and be I'm a role model, especially because a lot of the youth in California, it comes from immigrant parents as well. Uh, so, you know, I'm having a blast. It's a very, uh, yeah, I'm grateful for this position. And of course, your background is, uh, is quite um, amazing. You were born in Caracas, uh, in Venezuela. Um, and of course, you, you talk about the idea that you use postmodern strategies to create artworks uh, that reflect the fragility of fleeting moments. And goodness knows we are in a fleeting moment right now. Um, your work has been exhibited at Southern Exposure, the Berkeley Art Museum, and Bart Gallery, all in the Bay Area. Um, Museo de Art Contemporary in Bogota, um, as well as New York. You attended Skowhegan. You got your BFA from Cooper Union and your MFA from uh, UC Berkeley. Tell us a little bit about your time at Cooper U Union. What was that like? Wow, it was crazy. I, I, I moved from Venezuela directly to do my undergrad and the whole, uh, you know, it's a free institution or historically it has been a free institution. And when I was there, the new political like climate within the school was shifting and there were a lot of protests happening around the fact that they wanted to remove that from the institution. By coming from Venezuela, already having been part of a lot of protests, <laughs> I feel like my time uh, as a student in Cooper, I was a little older and I was not necessarily engaged in that political movement because, again, I was just very focused on, on my education at the time. Yeah, I thought about that when I saw that about you being there in 2014, because that was really at the time when the board had made the transition there. And of course, I was living right down the street from it at the time. And, it, you know, it was a big deal. I mean, Cooper Union was really meant to be sort of a free college for everybody. And it was set up in that particular way. But then economic realities or business people or whatever it is, they made the decision to move in another way. And of course it, 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 it upset the apple cart certainly for um, higher education in the art field um, in many ways. Well, cause it is an example of possibilities and it's a beautiful institution, partly because of the fact that it can be one of a kind in that, in that regard and, and set up an example of what education or higher education in the United States should be like. 
Yes. You know, I was person, like I was so blessed to be like I could not have moved from Venezuela if, if that situation would have been any different. Yeah. And of course, it is in kind of sacred queer space there, because there you are with Cooper Union right at the mouth of St. Mark's Place and the St. Mark's Bass was right down the street and the village voice was around the corner and the saint was only three blocks down the street. And even while you were there, there were places like the cock or the hole or other places, the Phoenix or uh, the nowhere bar or, or you know, it, there, was, there, there was a lot of artistic queer history in that neighborhood that you went to school. Yes, I, I had the chance to go to some of those places myself. <laughs> uh, but also see like historical records of other artists that I admired in the area, like Jack Smith, for example. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, your practice today, uh, you're making work. Um, and of course, uh, we're going to see some of your, your work. Um, but of course, it also it seems as if you've developed a practice which has got um, several um, aspects to it. You, you're doing your own studio practice. You're doing a public practice as well, too, as far as murals and things that are going on. Uh, but then also you're doing an educational practice uh, involving, involving kids. And uh, so talk to us a little bit about how those three things fit together. Uh, well, I think that, you know, coming from a country like Venezuela, which was a mono producer and we relied on the uh, oil industry um, only, mainly, not mainly, like mostly or only. Uh, and that was our pitfall in terms of then relying on just one resource. And I feel like that has kind of informed a very, <laughs> uh, how you say that when you eat everything around you and you try to make everything work uh, so anyways, I feel like from the get-go, my practice has been very multidisciplinary and I've been trying to make sure that things feed themselves. Uh, and in that way, you know, it's hard. Like, I mean, for me, art and life are connected. And as that, I, I think that, you know, any anything I do is kind of part of that, of that, of that art uh, cosmology. And... Um, but I would say that in some ways, I also have learned to comportamentalize uh, ways in which I uh, run out there as an art practitioner. Uh, I develop a very strong uh, drawing practice because it's a way to relate to people with an object that they can consume as an art product quite easily. And it's, it's yeah, it creates, it generates like easier connections, uh, but what I'm saying is that I, I feel like I, I want to always be free and boundless. So I see every experience as an opportunity to expand and to grow and also like to keep evolving as an artist. Yeah. And, which is, you know, like at this point, I feel like I've been too fixated with drawing and then I'm like, oh, what am I going to be doing next? Is this changing? Well, for my two cents, for what it's worth, your drawings are beautiful. And also, I think, you know, for any artist, I think uh, um, being in the sense makes might make me sound a bit old school, but I think the ability to draw is one of the bigger, the ability to draw and perceive color are, and also shape. Uh, those three things for, for me are one are some of the most fundamental things that anybody can work at as far as uh, whatever your pr production is. Um, we, did you draw a lot when you, you were a kid? Uh, no, but I was always interested in arts. I was doing ceramics as well, which is also a medium that I'm super connected to. And I really enjoy, uh, you know, developing and using. Uh, I guess that when I, I went to Berkeley, they really had a great uh, ceramics department there. And I was also going back to it. And uh, I really enjoy the, mater the material, the working with clay and earth and like that connection with your hands and just making to be quite wonderful drawing as a matter of fact I remember when I started art school being my least favorite subject because I never thought I was good at it and because yeah because that's not like you know that's not the style like I thought that whatever people wanted was re connected to a more traditional style or like way of representation. Uh, but then I kind of broke that up and, and began to, to just use that practice as a, 
as, as a foundation to everything else I do. Yeah, because I mean, what's interesting is when you look at people who have a, a drawing practice, one of the things I look at is sort of the confidence of the hand and sort of the confidence of the marks that get put on the page. And looking at your work, um, I see a tremendous amount of confidence and self-assuredness of, 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 of what you want to leave on the page and what you want the viewer to actually see. Yeah, I, I guess that sometimes uh, I, I started when I graduated from high school, I went into engineering school oh, and, I, and I was there for a couple of years. Uh, I never thought I could be an artist as a professional pathway, like it was never within my family or like within my idea of what was possible. And I mean, that's where I love to be a teacher in the high school level is because if I can locate anybody that has this sort of inclinations and sensitivities, I can really push them to, to look further and to see me as an example. And I guess that once I went through the process of, cause I had to first come out of the closet with my family and that was already too painful to like, <laughs> kind of like also go ahead and say that you're gonna go and pursue an unconventional career in that sense. Um, but as that was such a process of coming out twice or like for a second time, I guess yeah. that once I decided to make that transition, I never doubted myself. And I guess that it was actually as a more of a grow, grown adult uh, within having my BFA or all of this uh, trajectory where I'm having the imposter syndrome. But once I decided to, to make that transition, I feel like it was always, I always believed that this was my pathway and that I was an artist. And, and so I feel like that's where, you know, uh, and I always have embraced people that are unapologetic about their practice. It's something that I can recognize, I adore first and foremost about everyone else's practice. I mean, commitment and, and certain amount of obsession within what you do, but also like, you know, that deep belief that you are pursuing your ultimate destiny, uh, if that makes sense, or like, just yes, and of course, life is short, and uh, and you know we have to figure out how we're going to do it. But you raised a very sort of uh, uh, titillating question here. What was more difficult, coming out to your parents as a gay man, or coming out to your parents as an artist? Wow, I mean, I guess that <laughs> that's a, it's a, a tricky question here because I feel like they always kind of knew both things were facts, and, yeah. and but it was just like a matter of. Uh, just not having the resources or tools to go on independently, having kind of the fear of, you know, breaking too much rules. But I feel like it was interesting to witness within my body that transition because um, when I was in engineering school, I felt way more, uh, there was a lot of more eyes on my decisions within this. But when I transitioned to be an artist, I felt like society all of a sudden left me alone with whatever I wanted to do, which was mostly my fight and yeah. just, to, just to be. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think that's some freedom. That is a freedom that many uh, people who pursue artistic careers, whether it be in music or literature or visual arts, that, you know, they're, they're relieved at least for a certain period of time of some of those pressures and they get to do it. But then of course, as people develop successful careers, then of course the pressure begins to mount because then you have to, well, when is he gonna be on the cover of Art Forum? And when yeah. is it, you know, <laughs> when is this book going to get the Pulitzer Prize? And, you know, and so those kind of things start coming up um, and, and they can cloud one's, what one's view and everything there too, so. But it's beautiful that you are uh, working with kids. And so um, that what's the name of the school district again that you, you're in in California? Contra Costa is in Richmond. In, yeah. yeah. And so, and you guys are, you guys have a mask mandate in place and, uh, and your kids are do doing well. Uh, how's that working with? with well, you know, you have the event, like I, I'm sometimes like, this is my biggest pet peeve after two years or a year of wearing masks. It's like people wearing their masks like just like this. So yeah. th I have a couple of those a day that I have to be constantly reminding them, hey, over your nose. But overall, I feel like people are very well behaved yeah. and, 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 and taking it as serious as they can. 
I already heard that there was maybe a COVID case in ninth grade. You know, like there's already what is going to happen if this trickles down into people testing positive uh, for COVID, but they're testing the kids once every two weeks. We are just in week three, and I started this labor last year um, during Zoom. So this is kind of like, wow, having a nine to five is crazy. I'm still figuring it out, ways to go to my art studio and to make sure that I'm also, you know, pushing my, my practice while I'm here, you know? Uh, when yeah. you're talking about the cover of Art Forum, I'm here like uh, thinking sometimes about how I get a little frustrated with kind of like this line of work uh, because it's probably it's not that glamorous uh, direction. But then I had to kind of like wake up myself and be reminded that this is probably the best I can do at the moment. Like I get full, like full salary and benefits, something that I never had had. And, and then I can just build upon itself. And also like, there's so much pleasure you get when you get connect to make connections with kids and you get to see how they are so excited to see you here and how you can kind of like, I mean, week three and, you know, so some of those relationships are already blossoming because in the internet age, when we were through Zoom, it was quite a different uh, type of engagement and very difficult to locate how to support different types of learners and how to you know, create a Disneyland within the classroom, but also make sure that you are putting there some um, some nuggets for the kids to learn something. You want to teach them skills because uh, you want them to thrive and succeed in, in whatever it is that they are pursuing. So that's been great. Another thing that is great about where I work now is that I also happen to be the person in charge or like the adult that tutors um, kids in, in the Gender and Sexuality Alliance. So that has been very pleasurable because I can also be here fully as myself and, and you know, support different, you know, everyone from different parts of the, the rainbow palette. And I'm learning with, within that process, but I'm also, you know, a, a proud papa bear here, like, you know, taking care of my, my cops here. Uh, and making sure that nobody is in the wrong path here and within the bully side. Because I feel like growing up, uh, I didn't have a figure like that in my high school. And and so I don't know, like there's something very sweet about make, making sure that you are that person here. Yeah. It's, so, it's so rewarding, isn't it? To really feel like you're in that role. And I have to say, I mean, of course, your work is very well established. Your education is is top notch, but you but you also you just exude the the um, the the guidance and the support and the love for those kids and that you have. And it, it's just you have to be told this all the time because you have such a you have such a, an affect which which would make kids feel safe and feel and feel comfortable, not just from an art standpoint, but also from a queer standpoint as well too. Yeah, so again, like it's, it's like witnessing because during Zoom, it was kind of harder to see or get some sort of like rewards or like, like positive affirmations, like, oh, you're doing your job, you're doing it well. Now yeah. I feel like week three, I'm already starting to see, you know, kids making me bracelets, stuff like that, that, you know, it's, it's filling my heart because, because again, it's like, okay, I am establishing those connections and these kids trust me. And, and again, I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that because that's, that's, I'm, I'm happy with you being that person for them, you know? Sure. No, it's, it's so, so clear. So tell me a little bit about the drawings uh, behind you. Oh, well, these are just the elements of art, which are, part of the funda fundamentals of art, which is a classroom I'm teaching. Yeah. And <laughs> so this is just my, my whiteboard. We, we do have, a, this is a school with, with wonderful resources. Then we were talking with my advisory about <laughs> which mascot should we choose? Cause we need to come up with an advisory name and you know, like it's just <laughs> maybe not our work, but work work. 
No, but it's really, it's, it's really nice. And, and as we've been talking, I've been looking over your shoulder there at some of that stuff. And it's nice, it's nice to see some of that. So I know you have some shot, some slides to show us. And I know we're going to look at some of your work and also some public work that you've been working on as well, too, as far as murals go. But so talk to, talk to us a little bit about your public practice and, and particularly about um, making work for public consumption in pu public pu places about murals and pu public art and and uh, talk to, talk to me a little bit about that well uh, maybe i can start sharing my screen and sure. showing how i go about public life and art and uh, share screen desktop too so I'm starting with a self-portrait uh, here. Is this the screen I'm sharing? Can you see it? Yep. Cool. There you are. There you are in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, there I am drawing a uh, painting. Uh, I don't know if you can see here. There is a picture uh, of somebody. Uh, it's uh, Mark Klett's picture. It's called Artist Councilman Road. It was made in '81, and it's the same vantage point. It's just a different artist. It's a white artist just drawing and painting and and it's a black and white image. This one is in color. Uh, I think that I'm using this as a segue to just, I, I feel like part of my art practice has always been about consuming my surroundings and also camouflaging and maybe adapting to my new present situation as an immigrant, as somebody that is queer too. And, and it has had to uh, maybe, you know, some survival strategies. Uh, and some fuckery as well, I think, because this is also marking myself as somebody that is working within the San Francisco landscape. I'm using a very iconic reference, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, which is the, the gate to the, the west from the east. And also, again, a, a marker of such an iconic gay destination as it is San Francisco. Um, just a portrait of me in 2018. I like to start this uh, conversation uh, with, let me see. Uh, uh -huh. This is one of my drawings. I made it in my classroom here from my perspective. Something you note about my drawings is that I'm always in my drawings, drawing. I like, I like that idea of recording the art of creation and making. And I also wanted to share this because all my drawings are unless they're private done while I'm in my, my room or, uh, you know, sometimes I do drawings by myself with nobody looking, uh, but this always happened uh, publicly. I, I have a photographic uh, training. So I see this as long shutter exposures. They're like handmade Polaroids. I talk about them a little bit as handmade Polaroids. As you see, you see some of my students are all wearing masks. Uh, and this one, this was the day back to school. You see, I have a poster of Marsha P. Johnson over there because again, uh, I'm the GSA supporter here. And I think it's important to, to bring forward some, some figures that, need, that these kids need to know about. Uh, make art not war, do, do what makes you happy. Uh, this kid told me the other day, cause I, I've been telling them how one of my goals this year is to um, get some cartoons in the New Yorker because I really want to have a cover there. Not, not, not the cartoons necessarily, but the cover is something I'm looking forward. So I've been telling, dream, talking to them about it. You dream big. That's a wonderful thing for your work to be on the cover of the New Yorker. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, like, and I want to talk to them about it. I just got the encyclopedia of cartoons and I'm showing some of them to them so then they can give me ideas. They see me drawing. So they kind of know what my style is. Some of them were laughing because they were like, Mr. Figueroa doesn't know how to draw. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> GFY, which is go find yourself. So not to be mistaken <laughs> with go fuck yourself, which is what I mean, <laughs> but GFY. They have to find themselves, they're too young. Uh, this one I made in Dagmar 2018. I have around 2000 of these drawings. They're autobiographical, they're first source documents. They happen on site. I'm very committed to this practice because I also, you know, because it's a practice that builds itself and it gets just the more amazing, the more I keep doing it. So I'm very, you know, like it, it already has a life. And um, I have drawings everywhere I go. Like if I travel to a new place, I, it's a must. Sometimes when I'm here, you know, like last week, like first week of school, I made a drawing a day from the classroom. 
I haven't made no more drawings because, you know, like it also comes to a point where I need to do my work. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are good establishers and introductory cards to any layout or situation I am in. So in terms of public art, like this is probably the most uh, the most public practice, like, because you always see me engage in this. It's not, it's not a secret. It actually comes to a point where when I'm not drawing, people are like, either expecting me to draw or also very happy that I'm not drawing because, you know, you also have to live your life. <laughs> right. uh, this one is in Costco while I was getting tires. So that's what I mean. You know, like I, it's not that I go to an art place and I draw only in the MoMA. I draw everywhere and I like to draw in unconventional places and everyday life, you know, record everyday life. You see all of these tires. Uh, I think I got some Firestones here. They gave me some warranties, you know, here I am drawing. Uh, this one is in the DMV, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, it's such a waste of time. So I come prepared. I don't have time to waste. Uh, now serving you 133 at Windows 6. God, I mean, and this I'm reading some of my, my writings. These are first source documents and, and I label them sometimes. Sometimes they don't have uh, text, but most of the time they do. Uh, it depends also on my mood, but I see this as also... <laughs> some sort of poetry in some ways. They were playing Carlos Santana instrumental. And these are also like, you know, obviously as photographs or images that depict this place in time, they are memory aids. Come on, like, I feel like sometimes I see some of these drawings and I can be taken back to the place and time and moment and what was said. And so that's very special. Also, it's like a powerful, uh, uh, Kill to have because then I can decide what to include, what to erase from a moment. Uh, I mean, and again, obviously, like it's not that I am such a Machiavellic being that will make those decisions um, preconceived. Like you know, sometimes it is what it, it gets recorded, that whatever stood out, and uh, for myself, that's the filter, that's the lens. I am the lens, but also something to to be reminding you here, like here, for example, I am here. I usually can tell who I am because I'm left-handed. Not a lot of people are left-handed. And you always will see like some sort of um, pencil and a square, which is usually the format of my support. This was what's in Cherry Grove. I was watching this film called Cherry Grove Stories, uh, a film by Michael Fisher. You know, like obviously queer sites are also sites that I am invested in recording because queer history, matters and it's sometimes it's most of the times underrepresented and as an artist who's uh, I also work as my own art historian and my own like creating a collection of first source documents it's important for me to make that clear you know that I am here to also document these sites where um, people like us have been ostracized throughout history and people forget that you know we're people too you know like especially people that you know, I don't want to go into this. This was uh, at a dinner party in Cherry Grove. We were talking about coming out. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I, I write out things from, again, things that, that stand out. This is, you know, people, some people can recognize themselves, which is also nice because it is, again, a practice uh, that is public, but it's also like it works as a great introductory part um, card. And it's very inclusive. It usually includes everything that happens or all the people, you know, like I'm very, I, I tend to be mindful with that. And people see themselves, that's really nice. This is a recent one. I was at a pool party and some boys over here. This wasn't in Cherry Grove or the Pines, but it reminded me of it. So I included it. And I here have an outlier of a project that I made. I'm just gonna talk about it very briefly. I made this uh, bouncy house. I went to China. I was thinking about unproductive expenditure and I designed this all white and uh, no entry bouncy house because I wanted to make my MFA uh, faculty were, were telling me that my work was all over the place and they didn't know what to look at, that I had so many things, that where was the work and that if I could think about one gesture that could do the same that all of the things that I had in my studio. And so I thought, <laughs> and I was going to China for a class that you know was paying for it and I was doing some drawings there and I decided to go to a factory for bouncy houses well inflatables and kind of design my own 
and I wanted to make an accessible bouncy house. So all four walls, unproductive expenditure. And I kind of was like drooling about the idea of having this giant thing on and people just walking around, not being able to access it, kind of as only the special people could. Uh, but when I went to- Let me interrupt you here for a minute because I'm still paused on the idea of being in China and going into a factory that makes bouncy houses. Just that experience alone must have been pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, but I, I knew I was going in advance. So I already kind of, I wanted to go to artificial flowers first. Sure. And then I was like, oh, they must make uh, inflatables in China. So I'll just research. I got to three. We started conversations. I asked for budgets because this is also a thing. What can I afford? I am not an entrepreneur and I'm, <laughs> I'm not super wealthy. I'm not well. I mean, I'm wealthy in spirit and in heart. But, but you know, I, I do have a budget. And so that was kind of like a solution in my head. Like, oh, this is something that can be the one gesture that they're asking you to have that kind of reflects you know uh, my explosive you know and like very I mean I think that my, my practice is one of the spirit as well and I think that this structure in some ways is sort of a temple of sorts mm -hmm. anyways but when I went to the factory uh, to like explain my design and shake hands because I really wanted to go to the factory that was important especially because the opportunity was there and um, the people were like, oh, we can, um, like, how are people going to get into this object? And I was like, the worst, the worst thing to say is that it's on our project that they should not worry because nobody's going to, I don't care. Because uh, that kind of defeats the whole thing. So what I did is that I drew, uh, this was drawn, drawn, you know, I'm in meters because I come from Venezuela. I don't use food. I'm <laughs> a different colony. Uh, but I drew this ladder. And I was like, oh, people just go in and they jump. Uh, but people in the factory were also not convinced. They were like, eh, no, that's going to explode. That's physically impossible. We cannot make it happen. And then we had like a brief conversation. It was, I was kind of appalled because I, I didn't think it was a big deal. But anyways, at the end of the day, I don't know what happened, but they ended up shaking up hands. And when I got my object, they figured out this way of making vertical slips where people can just jump through. So, you know, it is accessible for sides. It has as many doors as you can imagine, you know, as there's slits. And it was a, a nice surprise and a reminder that, you know, these are collective works of art anyways. Uh, so I travel with it. And this is me with Vito Aconci. I had a studio visit. I was lucky enough to have a studio visit with Vito Aconci, who, you know, for those art uh, people, you know, who I'm talking about, it was yeah. quite incredible. To have him he was 75 at the moment i think he died like two years after and i was 28 at the moment we were bouncing together in that space outside of my studio very blessed opportunity again a way in which my art projects also mix with my drawing practice and probably why i show this outlier is that um again talking about that multiplicity of forms within my practice public practice you know because Last time I used this, I mean, it's in my laundry in my laundry room. It's kind of back, but I I, I lent it for a Juneteenth party event in my neighborhood, and people like kids love it. Kids love it. Mm -hmm. uh, also, a funny thing about this object is once I took it to Burning Man once, because I also happened to be there, and I I like to be making art everywhere I go, especially if this is kind of like such a desired destination, because I feel bad about going to a place and just relaxing and having fun when you know it, I, I should take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, but this is funny because after Burning Man, I took it, I, I showed it somewhere in Marin County and all of these kids came in and it was, they, they came out like fully covered with uh, <laughs> desert dust. It was very funny because, uh, you know, part, partly also like what this, the object for me is speaking about uh, it's the lives of the object on of, on of itself, like the people that have been there. I mean, for me, at least, uh, it is kind of like a time vortex. Uh, and I think about it like that. Anyways, I'm going to make a transition now. I just wanted to show you that project. Um, and I'm going to show about this neighborhood mural I just made, which is the first mural I have ever made in public and for the public. And also, like, this was no art institution supporting me. 
this was a neighborhood mural. Uh, and just to show you the scope of how this happened, this drawing I think I met somewhere in 2015, uh, we were watching RuPaul's Drag Race. It was probably season, I don't know, five, four, that was early days. Uh, and this is my neighbor's house. And uh, they're queer uh, and good friends of mine. They live a block away from me. This one was made in 2021 in the same house. So I, I usually go there and whenever they invite me to dinner parties or whatnot, you know, it's not uncommon for me to be drawing some, some sort of those events ever since 2015. So, you know, it's seven years of drawings there. I don't have to do it every time I go, but you know, whenever I feel the divine inspiration, I will. And uh, this one is also from 2021. Uh, my friends, Deontre and Cody are both DJs and they're a couple. They're now uh, going into an open relationship, which is interesting, uh, but fun. It's just really good to also grow with them uh, in terms of just being a support. Uh, this was us also planning for a Juneteenth party in the same living room because, I mean, this is kind of like a fast forward. But anyways, we live in West Oakland uh, and their house uh, is like maybe in the corner, like right next to the house where Huey P. Newton, one of the founders of the Black Panthers party was shot and, and died. And so that is just a, a geographical locational fact. Um, and so, you know, uh, in June, 2020, um, with the killing of George Floyd, there was like this uprising, seeing if COVID was here uh, in Oakland, people were kind of devastated and there were, um, there were a lot of movement around Black Lives Matter protests happening. And me going, you know, cause it's part of my community too. This one is one that happened in June 8th. Uh, as you see, Black Lives Matter, no justice, no peace, no racist police, socially distanced from anti-Blackness. Those are where some of like the motives I could see. Uh, on the same hand, these were like uh, marches. These are pictures of marches in, that were happening in the same time in New York. A lot of uh, mural art was happening in Oakland during that time, a lot of in downtown provisionally. But what ended up happening is that within these conversations with my neighbors, they were like, you know, we have this wall outside of our house. This happened, like, eh, this happened. Why don't we make a mural? Do you want to be making this mural? And of course, you know, like, I am so sick of bounding my work into a small format, you know, because I'm bounded to a piece of paper that I can travel with everywhere, right? So let's say 9 by 12, if I'm lucky, you know. Sure. Uh, so I, if anyone gives me like a 45 by six uh, foot wall, I'm like the most happy person in the world because <laughs> I also don't have access to a space like that in a studio. Right. And so I was really happy when they asked me if I was able to, I was also going through it because I'm not black. And I feel like, you know, it's just, it's not my place to maybe be making no comments, you know, but I took this endeavor very seriously, learning the process, learning through the process. And also like, this is a neighborhood I've been, that has adopted me ever since I moved to the Bay Area. So I feel like I felt some sense of entitlement towards this project, uh, especially because I usually don't tend to talk about my own despair as somebody that is displaced from my motherland and whatever crazy situation is happening there. I never felt like the need to exploit that narrative in order to to be like pushing my own artistic endeavors. And uh, so, you know, I mean, there's still, uh, there's still some gray areas in what I'm discussing, you know, and I'm, I'm open to hearing more about it, but also within that process, in front of their house, somebody else decided to make a mural. It was a little after my mural was completed, but around the same time of the killing of George Floyd, the neighborhood was kind of empowered and, and you know, like ready to make some sort of this gestures. This is, a, this is a picture of the mural in front of the house of my neighbors that happened after. And now there's a museum, the women of the Black Panther Party are, they're represented. I'm really happy and I have a collabor ongoing collaboration with the folks that organized this mural because we're neighbors. My mural is just around the corner and they've been 
very uh, professional in how they handled this project. I feel like the way we did our project was a little different because it was more like we're friends, we're queer, we live in the corner, we live in the neighborhood. We know you ever like for six, for years. Uh, why don't you do this? Uh, my friend like ra- like made a fundraiser via Facebook. I think they got like two thousand dollars, and with that, we got it going. But anyways, let's say that the mural I show you is in this house over here. Uh, this and where this X is is where Huey P. Newton uh, was shot. <laughs> then this is where my friend's house is, just kind of in front, and the mural is on this side. So here I am drawing, and to the right I have this wall where my mural is, you will see some pictures briefly. This is us prepping the wall on the side. Uh, just at the beginning, my friends were helping. I got some friends to help me out with just some mild outlinings, you know, and like, hey, these are words that I need to fill out. So this was also an opportunity to engage in collaboration. And unlike my other work, um, where I do a drawing in 20 minutes to two hours, let's say, depending on the context, this could took this took me a month. It was COVID time, so it was a great outside activity, a block away from where I live. Uh, those are my friends over here. This is part of the process. Uh, this is the whole mural. Uh, so let's let let's stop here on this image because the mural is really so beautiful. And kind of kind of walk us through. There's so much narrative in this yeah, mural, and, yeah, uh, and so walk us through it through this. Cool. Uh, I had some uh, shots coming up with some um, additional uh, close-ups, but we wanted to do a timeline because we know that the, the format that we got is, was just like an elongated line. And so I started uh, in this, in the far left with the Black Panthers, uh, with the Black Panther and Huey P. Newton around some kids in the stoops in West Oakland. And the, the same house that we're standing up, I wrote the 10, um, ten the 10 point po- program, which was uh, redacting in 66. I think that they had some edits done in 67. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the 10 point program, but it's basically what black people were asking and still ask because <laughs> it is 2021, but you know, the, but there's things that I think have taken a, a slow time and I think that these were revolutionary and just human rights in general connected to the basis of this 10 point, this 10 points. So it's all written down here. We have a little bit of um, a segue into the People's Food Program and some programming from the Black Panther Party that was not necessarily related to guns or militancy, because I feel like sometimes and uh, the Black Panther Party also gets to be framed as only violence and, and that's inaccurate. Like they had a lot of community programs that were feeding the people in ways that the state wasn't. And I think that they are inspiring for other types of new me- movement. Also another thing that was also expanded in the mural in the corner had to do with the presence of black women within the party because it was a movement that was very equal in, gen- in gender, you know, 50% or 51% of the Black Panther Party were women. Mm-hmm. And so that is not often seen or talked about or thought about. And so I wanted to make that relevant by painting these two, two figures a little long. And then they are from archival images. And let me just go, these are the two women's, some close-ups so you guys can see what I'm talking about. So this is the first panel, you know, like here we have U.P. Newton, you know, it's my, within my free, very bold, it's kind of like, also like, I don't do this often, but I was all game when the opportunity came. I was trying to, to paint some of this uh, breakfast programs that they had. And then here, a lot of like the black women, including uh, Chaka Khan was <laughs> famous and then Angela Davis I think is here wearing the orange uh, then it goes to some protests that happened in Oakland I think in the late uh, in the early 80s I feel no where Huey P. Newton was in prison and, and Oakland went crazy and got him like he was released I think that there was an altercation with a policeman that died and he was in prison but 
people in Oakland were protesting with free Huey signs and and he got released. Moving forward, let's see. Your work is so rich um, in political content and particularly around race. Uh, where do you think that that came from uh, for, for you? What, what, what was the motivating factor? Were there individuals who, who shepherded you there? Was it something just came uh, from yourself? Uh, well, I just feel like I cannot deal with ideas of injustice. And, and, and I think that that is something that is very clear on this struggle specific to the United States and in relationship to black people. I think, I don't know, I also grew a lot to see the context I came from and, and uh, kind of analyze it under those cases and, and see where maybe sometimes I was also not <laughs> aware enough. Uh, so I don't know, I felt like it's also like a, as a queer man myself that also has seen <laughs> some of what was happening here uh, before the gay liberation movement and then with the, with AIDS. And I don't know, like, I think that there is uh, some connections of like inner feelings on like what injustices look like and how we should just... <laughs> support people in general so yeah i mean i think what's interesting about the work is is of course between gender and race and queerness there is it it's it's sort of almost a perfect representation of intersectionality and in the sense that it is it it appears to be really trying to represent that as best as it possibly can as non-representative as the work is but it's all laid out in front of the viewer for them to be able to put all this to, together. Yeah, and I mean, and this in this mural in particular starts focus on the history of the place I live in because this is also all based in Oakland. Uh, and, but then I guess it moves a little forward into this intersectional idea. Uh, once it, you know, from this, uh, this actually, this protest of free here, what I think we're in 69, because then it goes to Stonewall over here. I, I, I included Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera into this because I feel like that was a spirit, some spirits I wanted to call in in this fight. And to also, uh, I felt like this was an opportunity to educate my Black, my black audience and, and really make this connection with queerness. So, so you know, all of those black queer kids that can show up around this also get inspired and see these figures so they know. Yeah. And, and so with your students, with your students in 10th and 11th graders, uh, how do they respond to this work? Well, you know, like I, I haven't been like, it's kind of like a liability for me to show them my work directly, you know? So it's not that I can come here and do a talk about my work. Yeah. Um, but I think that they see, it, you know, they see it in my classroom. Uh, I don't think I had to. I don't think I had to show them this. So then they see who, like, who I am. Like I have, I have a giant James Baldwin poster here and Marsha P. Johnson. You know, sometimes I feel like I should have more of Latino, like, or like Venezuelan people, and and these are the people I have represented in my classroom. Um, and again, I feel like living in Coop, like living in New York, uh, gives me like this. I know Christopher Street, I know Stonewall, I've been there, uh, you know, and even if when I was there, it wasn't the iconic or the moments or like the struggle, I still, I'm still connected to that legacy and I'm grateful for those events to have happened because they brought me where I am. True. Uh, and so, and yeah. True. And so again, like, I think it's really relevant for me to like bring these images forward. And yeah. this, yeah. Uh, so then the mural goes uh, from some sort of um, Oakland base to Stonewall and intersectionality, like I'm a black gay man, I'm a black man, I am a man. So it's a relation to these struggles. But then in the 90s, I think with the one million people march in Washington, I, this is a historical image too. This is also like uh, good to mention because it was 
one of the first time I get to use a reference images to use in my work. And some of this also um, posters are from my drawings. So I use both red, like his archival images and also drawings of my own. Mm. Uh, this is a neighbor that was passing by while I was making this mural and she was like, I love it, but I don't see uh, no elders with walkers represented in this mural. And I was like, hey, how about you come down and post and we'll make sure that is included. Which she gave me a very beautiful post and candid picture that then was translated into a part of the mural, you know? And so it's, yes. yeah. this to say that this was a process public and it was open. And I love the fact that I didn't have to deal with no organization telling me what to do and to give them a map going to be representing one-to-one. -one because, you know, these are the magic moments of uh, showing yourself as a creator and being able to connect to people and being able to hear what they had to say and being able to give them that gift as well of like being represented and being part of it. And you, you may have mentioned it, but tell me a little bit about the fence that this was painted on. Uh, whose pr property is this? Well, that's funny. Uh, the property, uh, you know, the neighbors I talked about that I know for maybe like ever since I moved to the Bay, so seven years, uh, they rent. So it's just the owner of the house. Like, they, It seems that the people that like, <laughs> my friends that rent and the house, they technically put the fence in so they could say what happened in the fence because before there was no fence right but the house is owned by other people and I don't know what's going to happen after they move or not but I feel like it's all now part of the neighborhood and most of like the murals that happen after um, the killing of George Floyd were more uh, let's say they were not as permanent as this because they happened in downtown and they were uh, around the the, the wood panels of the stores that were closed. So, you know, like they were more ephemeral. Right. The mural that I show you in the other neighbor's house, they did it in a way that will be permanent. This, I think there's a question mark. Yeah. It's already been a year and, you know, and it still holds up, which is a happy thing for me, you know, it's my first mural that I did. Not necessarily willy-nilly, but, you know, like you learn a lot the first time you do something. Well, but also, as you say, that it, it's a very, uh, it's a process that evolved simply by having that woman on the walker in the purple dress coming by and commenting on it. Uh, you were open to be able to have um, her representation in there as she was part of the neighborhood. And uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, that was definitely one of the highlights of the process. Yeah. Uh, because again, it's just like, I, I think that those are the moments in my life where I shine the most, right? Where there's a surprise and then there's a surprise. Uh, I don't know, like, again, like, I think I make art for, like, I like the idea of making art for people as much as that maybe sounds uh, corny or, or overplayed. Uh, but I do enjoy those moments where, you know, real people get to embrace and connect and admire your creative gifts. You, you've touched on this, and of course it's in the panel, but you have mentioned Hu Huey P. Newton. And, um, and so talk to me a little bit about um, the influence that he had on you and your, your work and, and how you perceive that t today. Huh, I mean, I guess that he is a representative of what living in West Oakland has had in me in terms of uh, making me more aware of racial differences and racial histories and racialized events. Um, Huey P. Newton uh, was the face of the Black Panther Party somehow because he was one of the creators, of course. Um, I think like with any other public figure there are it's, it's also convoluted I didn't know him I didn't meet him um, but I again I think I think uh, I am so seduced by iconography and he's definitely an icon from here yeah. and I'm also so seduced about consuming whatever is there for me to take and learn from somewhere and I think that that was something I really needed to learn because next time where I move somewhere else, you know, knowing 
the timeline, the events, the 10 point program and the Black Panther Party more than a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I, I think it gives me some sort of power because the Black Panther Party was talking to the gay liberation movement too. And and as much as I a part of me thought that black people, some of them, some black people are homophobic and that's probably carries on and as true. And you know, and maybe yeah, homophobic or maybe femphobic. And I know that that's not the case for all. And like a lot of these thinkers wear pro-gay rights. And I, you know, like this idea, I'm not necessarily intersectionality, but just radical solidarity. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like some, I'm, I'm pushing it because I also don't want to, I don't want to believe, like I don't want to make here a, a fake Disney story. You know, there's still a lot of questions too that I'm asking myself in this kind of like, power dynamic and relationship but at the same time I'm also like trying to document like a historical narrative uh, and making sure that people are represented under a bold colorful and powerful uh, light I think that I'm glad to know that I succeeded because again this is a project that I you know that has that the neighbors have reacted positively that I know is it's it's quite beautiful like i mean i i know my way around color you know probably it's not the best representation of the, the thing but you know like as a whole work of art there's unity and there's intention and and it, yeah so what's really beautiful about that is the fact that you're absorbing the area that you're living in right now and sort of absorbing the conversation and the context uh, that may happen have happened before you, you were there, but you understand almost the ghosts and the spirits that are around you and the impacts that were actually ha happening there. We're going to have to. We are at our. We're at our hour now. Believe it or not, it goes by so fast, and so it's so great. Um, so, Jose, it's so wonderful to meet you. I hope that we can find a time for you to. Um, come to Florida. I would love for you to come into the archive here and to be able to see things that, uh, that could inspire you to do other things. And then, um, as I said, there's also a little project. I'll text you tomorrow and we'll find a time that I want to talk to you about it as well. But I want to thank you for sharing all of this work with us. Uh, the mural is absolutely beautiful. It's lovely to hear all of your thoughts and, and, and to see you in your classroom there. Um, and uh, so thank you. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, as I said, I'm Hunt oh, yeah, great, great picture of you, you there. I'm Hunter O'Haney, the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archive. And we're very happy to have you all here. Uh, join us next week or the week after. Uh, we're usually doing shows every other week. They're all archived at stonewall-museum.org. And uh, many thanks to our friends at our fund for being able to make this series possible. Um, Jose, nice to see you. Nice to meet, meet you. And uh, we will see you very soon. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, have a wonderful day.